So, what is the state of the nation currently? We'll be looking at uh, the previous state of the nation addresses and, you know, in our own perspective and views, try to, uh, you know, share what we think is the current state of affairs and also, um, you know, try to make sense of what has happened in the previous years as against what's going to be happening tomorrow when the president goes to parliament. In the meantime, though, let me bring you highlights of uh, major stories happening today in Ghana. The minority in Parliament says it will push for the prosecution of the trade fair uh, company chief executive over the demolition of some structures at the centre. Minority members on the Trade, Industry and Tourism Committee of Parliament further served notice to haul trade and industry minister before the House to answer questions on the exercise. The Civil and Local Government Staff Association of Ghana, Cloxac, threatened a nationwide strike if government fails to pay fully their interim premium. Uh, the Executive Secretary of Cloxac, Isaac Bampo Ado, made this known at a news conference in Accra. Now, the New Patriotic Party, uh, NPP, has lashed out at the opposition National Democratic Congress for describing President Akufado's government's fight against the Galamse as a failure. The party says the NDC's accusation is a mere attempt to score cheap political points. Now, the Ministry of Health, together with the Ghana Health Service and its partners, are seeking to vaccinate some 2.4 million children who do not have protection against polio type 2 virus. At a media briefing in Accra, health experts called for cooperation uh, from all stakeholders in the exercise. And in the House of Parliament, government through the Ghana Airport Company Limited has rented the ground floor of Terminal 1 to a private company, that's McDonald Aviation, for use as a logistics operations centre for a period of 15 years at a cost of $350,000 per annum. The agreement has raised concerns with the minority MPs. And an Accra High Court has dismissed an application filed by lawyers for the National Democratic Congress's national chairman, Samuel Fosampo, for who is seeking the court to stay proceedings of his trial. Justice Samuel Esiedu, in his ruling, said that the application does not border on issues of law that will compel the court to hold on with a trial. So those are the stories making headlines here in Ghana. Let's find out what's happening elsewhere around the world. And we are starting from the uh, United States of America. The Secretary of State in the U.S., Mike Pompeo, has warned that the South African government's plan to expropriate land without compensation will be disastrous for the economy and the nation. Mr. Pompeo made the comments in Ethiopia, the final leg of his visit to Africa, which also saw him go to Angola and Senegal. Low-skilled workers would not get visas under post-Brexit immigration plans, uh, which has been unveiled by the government. The government is urging employers to move away from relying on cheap labor from Europe and invest in retraining staff and developing automation technology. The Home Office said EU and non-EU citizens coming to the United Kingdom would be treated equally after EU-UK free movement ends on the 31st of December. And the U.S. State Senate has voted unanimously to decriminalize polygamy among consenting adults. Under current laws, anyone found to have multiple spouses could face up to five years in prison. Proponents of the bill argue it would remove the secrecy surrounding communities with practice uh, communities which practice polygamy and allow victims to report abuse. But critics warn it could empower abusers. Was it as simple as that? 
All right, so uh, at least you have a fair idea of what's happening in Ghana and around the world. So let's settle down for today's major discussion. We're going heavy on the State of the Nation address to be uh, delivered by the President tomorrow in Parliament. And uh, talking about the President, he will be in Parliament uh, for his fourth State of the Nation address, which will be happening on Thursday, the 20th of February, 2020. Article 67 of the 1992 Constitution enjoins the President to deliver a message on the State of the Nation to, the, uh, uh, to, to Parliament beginning every session of Parliament. This will be the President's penultimate address before his first term ends. The NPP gave, uh, came into office on the back of a myriad of promises in 2016. With about 10 months to end the first term of President Akufuado, what is your verdict of the state of the nation? Not from then, but in the last year, what would you say it is? We'll be looking at uh, some of the um, other state of the nation addresses that the president has delivered since he took office and then try and put that in perspective. In his first state of the nation, that is, uh, President Akufuado touched on a number of issues, including uh, the economy and then the state of some key policy initiatives including the planting for food and jobs and free senior high school policy, which has been the flagship of the current government. So let's listen to the president when he went to parliament in 2017. Ghana's death stock now stands at 74% of GDP after all the previous denials to the contrary. More debt was a accumulated by the previous government in the last eight years than all other governments put together since independence. In fact, 92% of Ghana's total debt stock was incurred in the last eight years under the previous government. The interest costs on this debt, the interest costs on this debt have also increased and will amount to an estimated 14.1 billion CDs in 2017. Mr. Speaker, the reality of the state of Ghana's public finances today are quite stark. And I will not allow this economy to collapse under my watch. Mr. Speaker, Order. Ghana's banking sector <clears throat> has not escaped the economic decline has become increasingly fragile. Bad loans in the banking sector have risen significantly. Economic and financial data from the central bank show that non-performing loans have risen sharply from 11.2% in May 2015 to 17.3% in December 2016. The recent asset quality review of banks shows significant vulnerability of banks to current economic conditions, with many exhibiting significant weaknesses. Oh, Mr. Speaker, God. at the beginning of March, the Minister for Finance will come to this House to lay out in the national budget the details of our economic policy and the clear roadmap that we have laid out for taking the country out of its current predicament and onto a sustainable path of recovery, jobs creation and prosperity. We have to irrigate our lands and equip farmers with the skills needed to make farming a well-paying business. Farming by encouraging many people to take it up as a full or part-time activity. A national campaign, planting for food and jobs, will be launched to stimulate this activity. An amount of 125 million Canadian dollars has been secured from Canada, a friend of our nation, to support the initiative. That was His Excellency President Akufuado in 2017. And in 2018, the President told MPs that economic policies being implemented by his government have started yielding fruits. Mr. Speaker, I believe that last year, when I came to the House, I conveyed my dismay at the full extent of the economic mess in which our nation was mired. We had inherited an economy that was in distress. Choked by debt. 
and with macro and uh, with macroeconomic fundamentals in disarray. disarray. You will call, Mr. Speaker, that I said, quote, we would have to implement some tough, prudent, and innovative policies to get us out of the financial cul-de-sac we were in. I made some brave predictions. I said we would reduce significantly the budget deficit, and I said that at the same time, we would grow and expand the economy. I'm glad to be able to report, Mr. Speaker, that the economic management team, under the stellar leadership of the strong, brilliant economist, <laughs> Vice President, <laughs> Vice President Muhammad Mbuhaumia, <laughs> has risen to the challenge and the hard work is beginning to show positive results. We have reduced taxes. We are bringing down inflation and interest rates. Economic growth is increasing from the alarming 3.6% at December 2016 to 7.9% in our first year. And the indications are that it will be even better this year. We have increased our international reserves, maintained relative exchange rate stability, reduced the debt to GDP ratio and the rate of debt accumulation. We have paid almost half of arrears inherited. President Akufuado in Parliament in 2018. We'll be bringing you what he said in 2019, where he touched mainly on issues of security, because it was just a few days after the Ayoso West Wagon by election that went south. All right, let me introduce my colleagues in the studio now. Winston Amoy is host of 3FM Morning Show, which is a sunrise on 3FM 92.7 on my immediate left. And then also we have um, Alfredo Kansi, he's the head of the business desk here at Media General. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How is the state of your individual economies, or at least your individual uh, affairs? How is that state? And looking at it, I mean, I mean, on more seriousness, looking at it as a, as journalists who've covered all the years under review under the Akufado government, what would you say is the current state of the nation? We'll start with you, Winston. Well, Martin, let me just say good evening. A very difficult one, uh, because if we were to look at the state of the nation, you know, there's been this whole conversation about just a state of the nation and just looking at um, where we are currently, where we intend to, uh, to go, and how we intend to achieve that. And so if you put all that into perspective, you would say, for instance, that, okay, so this is the state of Ghana. And I'm sure there are many people who would look at, uh, you know, all the figures that have been churned out and say that, indeed, if we're growing around 6%, if we inflation is around 7 point something percent, less than 8%, you know, the government's target was 8 plus or minus 2%, then a lot of things will be going on well. But you see, um, you've asked a very important question. You've asked how I feel. And what I would say that has been challenging, um, as not as, I mean, you would have expected, uh, it could always be better. Mm. But the other challenge also is that we can't use, for instance, myself to judge how the economy is doing. Because a lot mm. of people who probably, uh, even though many of us would say that uh, we don't see ourselves as middle class, as journalists, a lot of the populace would see us as middle class. There's actually a challenge, you know, because um, when we're measuring well-being in Ghana, we always would use some of these indicators. We'll use the GDP, we'll use the um, you know, inflation, we use depreciation, we use interest rates, which are good because then you're looking at the fact that uh, the rate of increase in the price of goods and services, though they've been going up, they've been increasing at a decreasing rate. And so all things being equal, the idea then is that, uh, you know, the disposable income, the amount of income that somebody could spend uh, would be better if right. it had probably gone up higher than it currently is. Mm. But the other challenge also is that, you see, Inflation is measured in a basket. I mean, there's a whole basket that we'll be using measuring inflation. And so in some uh, regions, inflation is very low. In other regions, inflation is high. Mm -hmm. And so for all you know, uh, uh, where, you find us, uh, where we find ourselves, inflation could be high. Where you probably or Alfred finds himself, inflation could be low, for those who are watching us now. So what I want to say is that 
I wouldn't be able to use, if I want to use myself, mm. I'd say that, oh, things could have been better. Mm -hmm. But the challenge in measuring the well-being of the Ghanaian is that if I look at the Ghana uh, Living Standard Survey, mm. uh, the last one that I see was conducted in 2017 thereabouts, um, would that be enough to say that this is the true state of the Ghanaian? Mm. I am not sure that would be enough. But uh, wouldn't that vary? I'll be coming to you, Alfred, mm. uh, you know, mm. uh, but wouldn't that vary in terms of the various sectors we have in the country? So there are those who are probably very highly concerned about issues of education. And then there are those who focus on maybe infrastructure, and then um, you're talking about um, transport, etc. So all these indicators come together for you to then identify how the state of the nation is. And then the president, of course, is in a very privileged position to have been able to gather all that information. Then they can assess and say A, B, and C. So of all these sectors that normally play a key role, which one would you say that the, cur the current administration has been able to you know, push further to get that to help stabilize or get the nation on its uh, better footing? Well, I think, like, I mean, the current government has done well when it comes to um, the economy. The indicators are very good. But I told you that, uh, you know, beyond the indicators, uh, uh, somebody would tell you, oh, so that's the macro economy. The indicators are good. How about the micro? Mm -hmm. A measurement of the micro is a problem. I, I mean, I told you about Certainly. it. So I'm not going to sit here and say that and use the usual argument and say that, oh, but it is not showing in people's pockets. I do not have any data to back <laughs> that as I speak with you. So I'm not going to go into that argument at all. Right. Because when people have done it on a 3FM, I have said, show me the figures that says that people are not feeling it. So mm. I'm not going to go into that argument myself. I'm sure people who are watching us now would look into their own pockets, would look into their own situations and be able to tell us I have done. Mm. When it comes to education, there's a flagship program of a free uh, senior high school. Right. It's had a lot of challenges. I mean, let nobody run away from the fact that as much as the free SHS was good, I still would stay with a position I've always held that I think that a free SHS is discriminatory. Mm. It is. is it? it is. It is. <laughs> I do not see why someone goes to the boarding school and he gets his fees paid and another is a day student and uh, you know gets uh, his fees paid. Everybody, you see, boarding school is luxury. Boarding school is luxury. Everybody should have his day school students paid. Okay. If you want to go to boarding school, then pay for, that. pay for that. And the other thing is that, you know, we have a lot of congestion in the schools. I mean, there's been lots of it. When we talk about it, you know, because in Ghana we like to politicize everything, it's become a flagship program. So anytime you talk about it, the ruling government would want to jump and say, oh, you don't like free SHS, you don't like the government. But the truth is that there's a lot of congestion. The moment a gold, a gold track is leaving, mm. green track is coming in, there isn't enough time to actually fumigate campus and all of that. The challenge is this, look, Free SHS could have been uh, done properly. I still do not think that it should have been started in 2017. I think that it should have started in 2018. By then, the government would have effectively prepared all of us for free SHS. Okay. You don't sit back and say that, oh, because I made a promise. If they had done that in 2018, by like 2020, the last batch would be in secondary school. That would mean that all year, but, but, years are in secondary school. Clearly, there are those who vehemently disagree with you in that for every new major policy like the free senior high school there will be teething problems and as it rolls on i'm sure the government is putting in measures in place to mm. try and uh, the, make it uh, accommodating the, the, for all the challenge with that argument uh -huh. before Fred comes in mm. is that when you plan you anticipate problems it doesn't mean but, but that it also doesn't no, mean it doesn't that, mean that there wouldn't be problems uh -huh. but these problems a problem that should have been anticipated. Or could have been prevented. Oh, you, you know so. the number. You see, if you say you want everybody to go to school, and there was an argument I made in 2010 when the NDC complained and said, oh, the four years is giving us this and that, these and uh, that problems. My simple argument at the time was this. The NDC took office in 2009, January. The Form 4 people went to school in uh, September 2010. One and three quarters years is enough to build a lot of classroom blocks to accommodate them. Okay. So Let Alfred come in. Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, w the angle that Winston takes this um, free senior, yeah, free senior school, high school yeah. uh, argument, I would want to really find out from him a lot more what he meant by body school being luxury. I, I mean, that, that could be you know, a position that obviously could be debatable. And, since he's and, invited and, and clearly, me, I'll just answer. No, it's not an indictment. No, it's not an indictment. I'm only, only just saying... Just say, no, I, I am, being I, in a body uh, yes, and I want to answer. I'm only just saying... It will take us off. It's an opinion that obviously you are very much entitled to. You let him land. And when he 
you have a chance, when you get your chance, no, then you can no, do it. Let me answer before you come. When I'm not contesting your, your opinion. Your when opinion. we start from the boarding house, <laughs> if you hear what the school said, if you hear what Julia said, <laughs> they said boarding <laughs> is a privilege, it's not a right. Certainly. So it becomes a luxury. That doesn't make it okay. a luxury. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> Alfred, yes. We, we, what is we, your we, we've had a back and forth on this. So, I mean, yes. But then again, I mean, these policies, free senior high school and the likes, uh, government has always said, and this is not holding brief for them. I mean, we've made it clear at a, a previous instance that we all have our own reservations about how this policy was rolled out and others. But as to the starting date or year, any time this question has been posed to government or the information minister, at least I've heard him answer this a uh, number of times, he says, uh, look, so when, when, when were they supposed to start? I mean, oh, wait, so wait till when? Which time we, would be most appropriate to start? Exactly. Whatever so th then again, you can never have, you know, and they always quote a certain biblical reference to it that if you wait and wait, you never sow. So you, you've heard them say that mm. number of times. But I mean, yes, a policy has been rolled out. We've identified a number of these um, as problems in there. For example, the NAT and, and CCT are raising questions about the. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, abolishing of the uh, the do, was the double track, so that they they, running a double track they, they would have at least a single track because in their view it's putting a lot more pressure on on their members who have been teaching six months without a break. Mm. You know these are some of the concerns you can look at. Yeah. Also, uh, vacation classes was promised for. The, the green track when they are in the house, then the, you know the others will be in school. Mm. They will not miss contact hours. That did not happen. Mm. Okay, and when we asked, we were told that it was a goof on the part of whoever made, made made that statement. But that goof is very significant, especially for parents who who you know were relying on that supposed promise of they having vacation classes. Mm. That has not been done. We can review that going forward. But we cannot uh, overlook the kind of, I say, respite that this whole you know, policy has brought to especially parents. So yes, on that score, we cannot really downplay the impact that that, that free SHS has had. Yeah, but but, but going if we forward, broaden, if we broaden not just on the free senior high school, of course we, that we, is we could go, the the yes. banner that the current government mm. will be you know flying. But if you look at the various sectors or the other sectors that make up uh, you know help run the country, which other one do you think apart from education, uh, would you think that this government has been able to at least firmly uh, consolidate to help? in making Ghana a better country? Well, you know, we we'll still mention, you know, the, the, the economic indicators, and I am obviously biased towards that, so I would, I would touch on that. Yes, mm. as for the macroeconomic indicators, clearly nobody can contest, you know, the fact that at least they reflect a certain level of positivity. You can always raise the argument about how reflective it is. And there are many who say that we should rather elevate the whole measurement of the conditions of people to gross national happiness, how, how happy people are, you know, and, and all of that. But that notwithstanding, for example, policies like reducing the policy rate from 25.5 to 16 percent has been lauded. You know, and this is the Bank of Ghana heeding to certain calls uh, by government to do that. But the problem is that if you do not have a direct impact on the cost of credit, in as much as you know, the Bank of Ghana has reduced the policy rate from 25.5 to 16 percent, maintained it 16 percent the whole of 2019, mm. but yet still. You know, you st the private sector still borrows at a relatively high rate. I mean, the average you know lending rate now is about twenty three point five percent, which is very high. high Even yeah. the sixteen percent policy rate is is actually the fifth highest, I think, on the continent. So clearly, in as much as it is good, we could do better, and. To the extent that it's not even having a direct impact on the cost of credit is also another issue that really uh, a government can look at. I mean, what they can do, obviously, to engage in the moral solution and hope that the Bank of Ghana will speak to these commercial banks mm -hmm. to, to be able to respond, you know, a accordingly. And some of these taxes that were abolished as well, I mean, you, you have benchmark values being, being reduced, all with the sole objective of increasing or encouraging importation. As we speak, at least per the figures, 
imports haven't increased as was expected, even though the decision to reduce uh, these benchmark so values has cost us some revenue you know, over the period. Mm. So clearly that has to be reviewed going forward. But then again, these were some of these interventions that were meant to, we can, you know, uh, empower so you know, and the, then the private sector. And then on the issue of the economy, we can, I mean, let's rope in issues of borrowing mm -hmm. because it's almost always come up or anytime a government is talking about how well they are doing regarding the economy. So mm -hmm. borrowing, um, issues of debt, and then also the, the, how all of that ties into our GDP. I mean, coming back to you, Winston, how has that played out for the government? Clearly, the, the argument the opposition has made is that this government, in three and a half years, have borrowed more than they did in eight years. Mm. And if that is anything to go by, and then you compare that to the current, how the economy is being run now, do you think that then the argument the opposition is making stands strong for which reason then they, have a better alter they are a better alternative to the current government? Well, you know, um, uh, the, the thing about borrowing is, and the thing about an increasing debt rate, you know, politicians have a nice way of doing things. When they find themselves in government, uh, they see nothing wrong with the things they do. Once they find themselves in a position, they certainly would see a lot of things wrong with it. But, <clears throat> Martin, let me just do this briefly. Every year, even if a government decides not to borrow, the country's debt stock is likely to increase, increase by some six to eight billion. I'll explain. Mm. Because government borrows in dollars, and a debt is measured in cities, mm. and the city depreciates against the dollar yearly, mm. you'd always have the debt stock increasing, even if you choose not to borrow. The sad aspect also is that when it comes to borrowing, and the basic principle is that when you borrow, you should borrow to fund projects that are self-financing. So you're borrowing to do projects that you say, okay, so if I have to wait 10 years to do this, for instance, it probably might go up, but if I should do it today, I'd be able to generate enough funds to be able to repay it. So um, the country's debt stock was around two, uh, 122 billion uh, when the vice president did the, um, you know, uh, when he presented did a statement, town hall meeting, he talked about the debt stock being about um, 214 billion. If you look at that alone, you, 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 you would see that uh, there's been an increase of almost 94 billion. Mm -hmm. But I'm also told, I think if you look at it for up to the end of January, I think it's about 220 billion. Now, but let's use the one that the Vice President talked about. So it's about 94 billion. Yeah. Now, you ask yourself, 94 billion, 214 billion. Currently, it is just around, I think, less than 60% of GDP. So mm -hmm. we have not reached debt and sustainability limits now. But there's also been a rebasing of the economy. Mm -hmm. So if we had gone for the previous economic measurement, we would have gotten to probably about 70%. But I am also not going to go into that because rebasing of an economy is something that is doable. Okay. So then what's my point? My point is that up to today, I am still struggling to see a lot of the things we use the 94 billion Ghana cities for. Well... This government may not have used it for physical structure. I mean, mm. the tangible infrastructure that the previous administration used. We mm. saw uh, schools, roads, bridges, etc. Mm. Maybe that's what they used to help uh, the stabilize the economy as it is, isn't stabilize it? Stabilize the economy in what form? <laughs> if you say that you are doing, and I've read this here, head of business desk, you say you are doing <laughs> uh, 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 debt reprofiling. Uh -huh. Martin, if I go and borrow, I owe 50000 You see. Mm. Then I go and borrow, uh, you know, I look at the interest rate that I'm paying. And I think that as somebody, so for instance, when the, uh, you know, policy rate came down, I said, okay, so now it's about 23%. I have a debt that I pay 30% for. Mm. So I am going to borrow at 23% to offset the 30% and spread it. Mm. What that would mean is that I would be losing, I mean, I would still have a debt Unless I choose to increase the debt that I've take, I, I, I'm going for this time around, mm. if I just choose to settle that debt, it will still be the same debt. Is that not the case? Is that not the case? Is that not what you see? Mm -hmm. So it tells you that we have borrowed for other reasons. Okay, we borrowed 13 billion for the banking sector reforms. Mm -hmm. Push that one aside. What did we use the other ones for? Free SHS would not be one of them. Because we have made it obvious that we're able to do what? We're able to, um, as it is, use petroleum funds 
and we're able to settle our debts. So then comes the challenge. The vice president makes a point. He talks about the fact that, oh, you know, we, are, we, are, we have primary surplus. If you remove interest payments, the monies that we generate domestically mm. are able to take care of all our needs. Is it the case that when it is time for us to settle our debts, we go and borrow to pay interest and the principles on debts that we have, or we are borrowing for consumption? Because if you look at it critically, and I'll give you a typical example uh, before our I friend think, comes yeah, in. Yeah, you make it uh, yes. brief so, for us. So we're, so we're looking at a situation where, for instance, um, we, we intend to spend some 85 billion Ghana cities as a total expenditure for 2020. Mm. Now, um, domestic revenue and grants totals 67 billion. 22 billion would go into wages and salaries. An additional 22 billion would go into the payment of interest. Not a debt itself, interest. Interest. Yes, interest. Government transfers, statutory transfers, would take in about 15 billion. 22, 22, 44, 15, takes you to 59. Then you come to goods and services. Then you come to principal payments themselves. So mm. you see, this is a country that if we don't borrow, we cannot survive. <laughs> Alfred, we'll be taking our first break now, but then that'll be after your submission. Well, yes. I mean, you, you, could, you, could, you could understand, you know, the, the worry of how the debt situation looks like. But, you know, one of the things that uh, yesterday, I think two days ago, the country director for the IMF re raised, which I think has actually not been the focus for this whole debt conversation, is the cost of servicing our debt, which according to the IMF, is one of the matrices that they actually take into mm. consideration in analyzing our debt. So clearly, if they say that we're getting into that realm of, of debt distress, they're not only looking at the figure and the debt to GDP, you know, they're also looking at the cost of servicing these debts, which is actually rising, which he re made reference mm. to. So I'm actually waiting to see how that will, will pan out going forward because okay. it appears that we have caught in this particular box of talking about debt to GDP, which is fine, but we, miss, we must not actually lose sight on the impact that the cost of service in these debts would have on Could the have, economy. Yeah. This is still the stands on TV3. Uh, I mean, clearly when it comes to issues of economics and the numbers keep flying, the billions and billions and trillions, we will be delving into other aspects of the economy when we return from this break. Before then, too, we'll let you know uh, or play back part of what the president said when, we went, when he went to parliament in 2019. Then, when we come back to my guests here, Alfred Okanze and Winston Amar, we'll be talking about issues of security, uh, job creation, the issues of uh, the Galamse, the environment and the promises that have been made, especially by the president when he said he was going to put his job on the line to make sure that Galamse is brought to an end. Then maybe finally, we'll look at sanitation. How clean has Accra been since the president made that promise? Stay with us in the back show. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is The Stance. Uh, it comes your way every Wednesday uh, where we give um, the opportunity to our colleagues here at TV3 to also, or, I mean, Media General, to share their thoughts on a number of national issues. And tomorrow, the president is expected in parliament to address the nation and tell us what the current state of Ghana is. And uh, certainly, we'll be touching on a number of issues. Last year, at the State of the Nation address, uh, the president touched on key uh, issues uh, within the sector, including the economy and education. Production in the economy as measured by real GDP growth has picked up very strongly in the last two years. From 3.4% in 2016, real GDP growth increased to 8.1% in 2017. In 2018, provisional data for the first three quarters indicate a strong real GDP growth of 6%, higher than the annual target of 5.6%. Real GDP growth for 2019 is forecast at 7.6%. Ghana's recent GDP growth has placed it among the highest in the world. The fiscal deficit is being brought down from the 7.3 of rebased GDP in 2016 to a provisional 3.9% of GDP at the end of 2018. 
The debt to GDP ratio has declined from the 56.6% of GDP in 2016 to 54.8% at the end of 2018. Inflation has dropped from 15.4% at the end of 2016 to 9.9% in January this year, the lowest in six years, as announced by the Ghana Statistical Service last week. Interest rates are declining, and so is the Bank of Ghana monetary policy rate. Decided to institute a legal framework to help with the discipline. We've passed the Fiscal Responsibility Law, Act 982, capping the deficit at 5% by law. And some two weeks ago, I inaugurated the Presidential Fiscal Responsibility Advisory Council. Mr. Speaker, revenue mobilization poses the biggest challenge in the management of our economy. With the tax exemption policy in particular, proving to be an Achilles heel and a growing menace to fiscal stability and revenue generation. That's President Akufuado, His Excellency, uh, when he addressed Parliament last year. He'll be doing that again tomorrow, uh, God willing, and uh, will be telling us what the state of the economy is. However, it was at that State of the Nation address where that he charged the NPP to... Um, right, or at least get to work with the NDC on ensuring that issues of vigilantism are dealt with decisively. This is an election year 2020. In about 10 months, we are going to the polls. <coughs> and from what happened at uh, the IASO um, West Wagon by election, a lot of people are concerned. And you can tell that right after that moment, uh, the Peace Council, for instance, took steps to get the key uh, players uh, in our political space to come to an agreement and you know, append their signatures to uh, codes of conduct that they would abide by uh, going into the election. That has not been even conclusive. And we are going to talk about security now, starting with you, Alfred. Mm -hmm. um, I think the concern for many is, look, do anything that you want to do, but let the country be as peaceful as possible. Absolutely. Do, um, you, get, do you get that feeling going into December? Well, so the, the president has been, and I started with him because he has the, the sole responsibility him, to ensure that that is actually done. He's been reassuring that um, there's not going to be any violence before, during, and after election 2020, which, you know, um, is expected. But beyond the words, a lot has to be done, mm. you know, especially because we still have Ayaso West Wagon very fresh in our minds. Um, with the NDC uh, still not very um, satisfied with you know, how everything else panned out, especially in the aftermath of the Mill Shot Committee's recommendations, that white paper that was issued, and the, the rejections that mm. we saw uh, from, from government to the extent that uh, they said that the committee had a number of its recommendations wrong, and so they did not, you know, accept that. According to some security analysts, it sent some wrong signals, you know, especially when we're talking about these two parties, as a matter of fact, political parties coming together mm. to ensure that they commit to peace. And you, you made the point about the Peace Council's efforts to try and get them to, to the table. You recall, I think, two, two weeks ago, the NDC actually failed. Sorry. What I say, not failed, they, they had a reason for yeah. that. According well, to the expert, they, they said it, the, the focus shouldn't be on just the two political yes. parties, yes. and that other political parties should also, you know, be brought in and, and made other to, stakeholders yes. and other stakeholders, including yeah. the electoral commission. And, but, and the focus, well, yes, I mean, to, you you hear them make the point that I mean, because to some extent, are, I'll agree with the NDC, but I do not think that the, N, the the electoral commission has a group of vigilantes. Of course not. You know, and in the first place, I've, I and this is the argument I have made consistently mm. that is right from the onset, the NDC and the MPP both categorically deny the fact that they had vigilante groups amongst their rank and file. Well, they you know, call so them names, but then again, I would agree with the short committee calling them militia, yeah. party militia, because vigilante sort of <laughs> downplays what they've been but doing. Well, whatever you it know? is, whether so, you call them militia, vigilante, it, it, whatever, it, they are a group of people that are used to cause chaos or True. mayhem. Exactly. So, and they must be dealt, they must be disbanded. <coughs> the parties are not even willing to accept that these people are ours, let alone go forward to say that, okay, henceforth, I'm cutting out 
yeah. any link with these people or I'm helping reform them and make them, you know, quote unquote, better citizens. No, but don't you, if, go, to the extent that they are going around in circles about this, should give you a clear message or a mm. signal of, of what they yeah, both think about level. this. You know, in opposition, you, you have a certain distrust for the, the security agencies and so you would want to have your own security. Mm. And then in, in the government of the day is also as accused to be manipulating uh, state the security state, state security. And so uh, th th there's that signal. We haven't, it's, this is not new to us, but certainly those political parties, this, they, they, they are expected, mm. in fact, the Ghanaian people expect that they will be responsible. We have come to the point where in the maturity of our democracy, we cannot keep doing these Please. things. We, as Ghanaian people, must demand this from them, mm. that they cannot be irresponsible to the extent of engaging in violence when in this the, way. You feeling um, any secure going into December? Well, I, if you had asked me this um, some a year or so ago, uh, prior to I was so West, I probably would have said yes. Um, if you had asked me this uh, two years ago, I would have said yes. The challenge here is that, you see, when the president made that call, that uh, the two political parties should, within a week, come and sit down and, uh, you know, judge or find a way to solving it, it was good. It sounded like a very good call, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But, you know, in 2011, Mm -hmm. Okada riders went to parliament. Now, their job was simple, or their concern was simple, that they should legalize commercial motorcycles. Then member of parliament for Loba Manyakobo, Michael Tenyaono, MTN, said he, he expected the police at the time to have arrested those people. You know why? Because they have just come to tell you, I am engaged in an illegality. Did you hear people write and show that we actually had laws in this country that dealt with vigilantism as we had it. They were laws, right? Mm. So when the president said, and the NDC and they went to sit at that meeting, they acknowledged that they had a problem. That was an acknowledgement that the NPP and NDC, they had a problem associated with election-related violence in this country. They mm. admitted. Mm. But you see, in the end, they started again. I don't have the right to, I mean, I think that uh, it depends on more people, it depends on, I mean, the other stakeholders who are supposed to be involved. I ask myself that simple question. Have these two political parties shown you that they are indeed committed to disbanding? It doesn't look like that. Well, they'll say, at least, uh, have the mere fact that they acknowledged mm. and went to sit at that meeting in itself is an acknowledgement, isn't it? I am going to say something. And next time, the two main political parties. The next time the flag bearer of the NDC goes somewhere, watch. Watch carefully those who protect him. The flag bearer of the NDC? Yes. John Mahama. Even if the president goes out, watch carefully those who work with the president. So for the president, his immediate... There are two men... Who are those who work with the president? I am, saying, tell us. I am saying that... <laughs> I am saying that... <laughs> The oh, next time are you, you saying that? Are you the saying next that? Time you no, see the president. Tell us, Let tell me understand us. what you're saying. Are you saying that the people who work right around John Dramani Mahama, former president, and the current president, uh, President Akufado, are they not are, security, state security oh, approved people, and that they are party that, people who am, are doing I the protection? I am telling you that you the next time. In fact, but I have but seen, I see the, them every day. The, who are they? Tell us. If the president decides to go on another trip. Yeah. Uh, to, to any region, yeah. I would alert you. But I, 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 I would ask them to give you days off. Go and see good. those who are, uh, what are, pushing, you, what are pushing, you pushing people left, right, center. It should have been the police or the military, you think? Well, but the president should be protected by the police. By the, by the, by the national security? The national security. <laughs> but the national security, they don't necessarily come in oh, uniform. I am telling you that. You watch those people. No, what did I do? You Who are they? You're giving us an assignment. I'm giving you an assignment. When you have, an, you have the answer to the assignment. I have the answer. I have the I, so I have spoken. I want you to also go and feel. So are you indirectly saying that the parties naturally Ask just trust to, their they, own they people? They use these people. They trust their own security than the state, whether uh, in power or in, in opposition. Up to today, eh? when the NPP went to uh, Koforia, 
Did you not see the people who came to uh, help uh, you know protect the, this thing, uh, the party at the Congress? Did you not see them? Did you not see the Delta Force people who were there? <laughs> Let us not pretend. So, uh, so, so that is, it comes back to the same point that then it questions the commitment of the political parties. I'm telling you that if you look at these two political parties, does anything tell you that they are committed to what they are signing? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, we are going to truth. take a quick breather now. When we come back, we'll touch briefly on issues of sanitation and then maybe rope in the current brouhaha or storm over the Galam Sea because it also directly affects the environment and has some linkage with, somewhat with issues of um, the environment and sanitation. Stay with us, we'll be back shortly. Thank you for staying with us. The president uh, at Manchagbona or somewhere in the Great Accra region uh, a few years ago said that by the end of his tenure as president, later the, the Minister for Environment was saying first term, second term, you know, let's leave that, that part of the debate out. But he said by the end of his first, uh, his tenure as president, Accra will be the cleanest city in Africa. How clean is it, uh, Winston? And then maybe while at it, you can rope in the issue of the environment and then broadening in and then maybe we can pull it yes, up. Uh, since our time is almost up, uh, the president makes the point and talks about by the end of his first term in office, let's not play with the semantics. Uh, <laughs> because, I mean, on the whole, uh, you, you have one term and, and you go and seek re-election. Nobody, re-election is not guaranteed. Um, the evidence is there for all of us to see just close to the Flagstaff House, even the waste bin that was put there was full and people were still dumping refuse in it. We still have not been able to dredge the outdoor. So it's one of those things again. Yes, I know a lot of things are being done. Um, but again, it's the usual slow pace of doing things, and we never seem to ever, you know, uh, get over it. But uh, Martin, so that bit of uh, Accra being the cleanest city, uh, I don't know what baseline study he even informed that decision is mm. not being achieved. Let me just rub in this about the, um, you know, uh, environment and illegal mining. When the president talked about tying his, um, you know, presidency to this, he came out as a man who was really bent on making sure that we stopped Kalamsi and. You know, the first few moments, we saw that something was working. I mean, mm. I remember going to um, uh, Nzema in 2018, and Ancobra had, had changed color. It was becoming clearer. Cleaner. Cleaner. The point is that that whole campaign was sustained also because the media consistently spoke about it. Right. The moment we went to sleep, government also went to sleep. But as the president put his job on the line, he did not put the jobs of MMDCEs <coughs> also on the line. He did not say that his ministers have also put their jobs on the line. And finally, the Galamsey campaign was run as a centralized government of Ghana policy mm. instead of running it as a decentralized policy. So you have people stationed in Takwa, stationed in uh, Obwase. By the time they move, by the time they get there, it would have been better <coughs> it if it was decentralized. decentralized. So it's in every district. Mm. You have Operation Vanguard operating in every district. You have the District Security Council in charge of uh, you know, this particular operation. So they would be able to quickly move and deal with them. That could have even created some bit of jobs for you know, some of the youth who do not mm. have jobs. Mm. And they should have also done this in, con in, in, in tandem or you know, together with the small scale miners, because they then would have been able to tell, this person is not part of us, this person mm. is part of us. Mm. As it stands now, mm. it has become one of those fights we have failed. Mm. Okay. Well, yes, I mean, uh, following up from there, clearly we, we can't say anything beyond that. R what I'm hoping to hear from the president is uh, his his position or response on the latest happenings with respect to this Galamse fight. The information minister, others have been speaking. Tomorrow he has opportunity to, to make it very clear mm. exactly what he intends to do going forward. Because clearly it's not an exciting sight. Um, with this whole fight that we all got involved in because we all have a responsibility. Now, going into uh, the, the sanitation, I just think that beyond the, the policy failures or flaws in, in that re regard, I think we also have to blame ourselves. I, I have to burst the bubble on that one because mm. it clearly wasn't supposed to be the government or the president's responsibility to do that. We all had a role to play and still in have ensuring a role to that play. Accra, not even, why are even Accra? The, the country, country. Yeah. becomes clean. And so, yes, from what we are saying, we feel it's attitude now. Mm. And the only way to do that is to have laws that will punish people. The laws are there. So what are we doing? That's where we are. Anyway, so, uh, well, I mean, my, my take on the issue of sanitation, um, 
it, it, it transcends the presidency. Mm -hmm. And like you, you mentioned, we all have a role to play. And a few months ago, I decided to start, even at home, segregating plastic waste from regular mm. waste. So now, when the Koliba people come, they know that give or take a few weeks, I'll be able to give them either two sachets of uh, plastics, you know, in, in all forms. If everybody can at least do something along those lines, they, because of all the problem, filth, babe. of all the <clears throat> filth that causes the most uh, damage, plastics, plastics, almost always, uh, you know. Then the, the AMA that, must educate. The they must educate the, these um, sanitation companies okay. because when they come. Those who segregate their waste, they just pick them and, and lump all lump them together. together and Is put the them guys who come for so, these So, I mean, yeah. so the, those waste management companies, they must they be educated on that. If, uh, if you have uh, waste management uh, people, those who do this, even if they have to, they go for a country, how they go for, and they say they are happy that they've been giving jobs. Many of them. They don't even understand what they are going to do. Doing. So <laughs> it's, just like, it's just another job that they have been giving. So they're just working. You don't understand what they're doing. Well, I have to leave it here for now. But thank you very much for watching um, The Stands. It comes, your way, it, come, it comes your way every Wednesday on uh, TV3 News at 10. I'm Martin Esiedi that I've been here with Winston Amoa, um, host of 3FM's morning show, that's Sunrise on 92.7. And then also Alfredo Kanse, who is uh, head of business here at um, Media General. Tomorrow, the president will be going to parliament. We will be bringing you live coverage of it on all our platforms and especially uh, here on TV3, 3FM, Omiya FM, Akuma FM, Connect FM and 3news.com. Do make a date and uh, be informed. Have a good evening and as always, stay positive. Bye.